This is BYU Sports Nation, brought to you by the BYU Store, simulcast on BYU-TV and BYU-Radio. Now, from Studio B, here's Spencer Linton and Jerem Jordan. BYU Sports Nation is live, your day-to-day play-by-play in Studio B, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere, Tuesday, May 26th. Hope everyone enjoyed your Memorial Day and long weekend Wherever and however you're connected, wonderful to have you with us. I am Spencer Linton, teamed up with Captain Countdown. Yes, even in the midst of coronavirus, Jerem Jordan. False. I'm not into it until it's under 100. That's when I'm, that's when I'm like, oh, it's kind of close. And right now, I hope it's close. We don't exactly know. Oh, yeah, well, uh, if the college football season were to be played on September 3rd, then technically it would be how many days? A countdown to the youths. 100 days. So tomorrow, in theory, I could be in. Tomorrow. Your captain countdown as of tomorrow. As long as the college football season starts on yeah, time. Yeah, please don't call me that. That's good. <laughs> Which, by the way, uh, Friday afternoon, uh, BYU Athletics announced, in accordance with the NCAA Division I Council, they will open up facilities starting next Monday, June 1st. Great news. For football, men's basketball, and women's basketball on a volunteer for voluntary workouts. So they have been closed since, I want to say, March 12th or something around there. Close to the that. The Thursday, day. right? Um, day after Rudy Gobert um, tested positive. So it's been a minute. It's been a minute. Uh, so that's that's great news. We're kind of creeping out, seeing what happens next, and uh, hopefully we can – continue to be healthy and and start life again to some degree we're we're seeing people out and about a little more hopefully we can uh wrangle it in a meaningful way and uh proceed and hopefully uh get back to life sure i had this thought over the weekend and i noticed this when i was a missionary in south korea on your mission trip sorry on my mission trip yeah. to pusan south korea that when people were sick, they would wear masks. Or if they didn't want to get sick, they would wear masks. And th- this is what Korea did. So it's no surprise that South Korea was one of the leaders in the forefront to get through the coronavirus pandemic because they were already practicing those things on a regular basis. So I'm thinking... Were they getting more sick than us for some reason? Or were they just... I, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, so th- the point is they flattened the curve really fast. Okay. Because they had these measures in place. So why not in America just practice good hygiene and social distancing when you're not feeling well? And if you're a little bit, you know, cautious and wear a mask out in public during peak flu season or peak COVID season, whatever. Great. Why not just do that? I like this idea. And I'm happy to see that things are starting to inch toward returning to normal. I'm really excited for the athletes just to be able to get back in because I, I know this must be going Bundes, crazy. Bundesliga is not doing it for you? Bundesliga and the <laughs> Korean baseball organization have not quite taken me there. Now, the match, yeah. however, between Tiger Woods yeah, and fun. Phil Mickelson, yeah, Tom crazy. Brady, Peyton, and that was fun. Crazy access. When you can hear what they're saying, it's cool. Hmm. Wild idea. Hmm. Yeah. PGA Tour. I'm sure that they have taken PGA notice. Tour? Major League Baseball. I'm thinking about other places. NBA basketball. (laughs) I'm thinking about other places. We're going to give you all sorts of access today. Here's today's show lineup. Is it time to buy the Zach Wilson hype? Most recently set up by Dennis Pitta via John Beck. You mean Dustin? If that makes sense. Yes, BYU football talk today. The voice of the Cougars, Greg Rebell, will tell us what he expects from Zach. Plus an ode to the most influential player in BYU basketball history. Maybe not the guy that uh, you think it is. And more national respect for BYU football stars protecting the quarterback. That kicks off today's BYU Sports Nation headlines. James Call Me Jim Empey is the highest rated center in the pro football focus best pass blocking offensive line returning in 2020 with a grade of 86.5. ESPN has Empey as the 10th best returning O-lineman overall. We've said it before. It's hard to quantify how good linemen are sometimes. And here we are, more James Empey love. I think it's time. He's an upperclassman now. It's time to call him Jim. Fox Sports college football analyst Joel Klatt believes the 2020 college football season will, quote, 100% be happening. Platt added in a recent tweet his belief that fans will be in the stands to some capacity at most locations and that the season will likely start on time. 
Here's hoping. Urban Meyer, heard of him? A man who's won national titles at multiple universities, said in response to Klatt's thoughts, I've talked to enough people. They're adamant this will happen, and that, and what that's going to look like will be determined. But they will be playing. There will be football this fall. I love those ideas. I really want it to happen. Talk is cheap. Let's say we got to actually do it, right? Eamon Brennan of The Athletic says, BYU basketball is a program like Gonzaga in a mid-major conference that isn't all that much of a mid-major in any structural sense. And no, there's no real reason BYU couldn't become a powerhouse. It's starting to feel like it's on its way already. More on this thought coming up in What's Trending. Sean Hill of BYU Men's Tennis is named the ITA Mountain Region Senior Player of the Year. Hill represented as the singles champion of the ITA National Fall Championships and was named to the West Coast Conference All-Preseason Team for a second straight season. He posted an 18-5 singles record, 12-6 in doubles last season. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's What's Trending on BYU Sports Nation. 100 days away from a potential, hopeful, renewal of the Beehive State rivalry and BYU-Utah to open up the college football season. 100 days away, and even a global pandemic can't entirely stop the hype train for BYU junior quarterback Zach Wilson. We had time for Dennis Pitta last Friday. Dustin. Sorry, Dustin Pitta last Friday. And in that allotted time, he relayed some feedback about Zach from his offseason quarterback coach, former BYU great John Beck. Choo-choo. Listen to this. John just was raving about him. Completely unwarranted. You know, I didn't ask him anything about Zach. He just kind of went in and started telling me about him. And he was like, they are incredibly excited about what the potential is for this offense because of how good Zach looks. Okay. Uh, Dennis added that John said he's way ahead of where I was at this point. Jerem, are you buying the Zach Wilson off-season workout hype? We do this every year, don't we? We, we just want to get excited about it. <laughs> yes and no. Let me tell you the no part. No, talk is cheap, okay? You got to do it. Um, but yes, because, listen, he's going into his junior year. Now is when he should really blossom. I think 18 for 18 against Western Michigan as a freshman was the best and worst thing that could have happened to him. Because then we went into his sophomore year thinking, if you, if you thought that was good, just wait, right? Then we found out about his shoulder surgery. Right, he has shoulder surgery, which, by the way, he's going to play the rest of his BYU career with a torn labrum on his left side. Ah, it's not a big deal. To me, that sounds like it's a deal. I've, I'm not the one throwing the ball, but anyway. Hopefully he's healthy for the first time going into this season. Played with the torn right labrum as a freshman. He got that fixed but couldn't work out and or be with his teammates as much, right, in that process. So yes and no. Let's look at some of his numbers, right? 64% passer through two seasons. That's, that's good. 7.9 yards per attempt. That's solid. I would like that to be 8+, plus, right? If you can get to the 9 range, now we're talking. 23 touchdowns, 12 picks. That's fine. Uh, you probably want a three or four to one ratio, not a two to one in that, um, unless you're like old school Alabama just running football. 11 touchdowns, nine picks last year. That, that wasn't good enough. Although Cam Meller, formerly a pro football focus now with SB Nation, says like six of those nine weren't his fault. Th- that's a slippery slope. You could go through a lot of quarterbacks and start picking away at that too. Five rushing touchdowns. He did lose three fumbles, one of the goal line against Hawaii, right? 140 pass efficiency. That's solid, right? Uh, one, one, uh, one concern I have is close games lost, right? So he's two and five in one score games. The two wins were Tennessee and USC. Those were massive wins. Awesome. Right? The losses, uh, NIU in 2018, Boise State. he sacked as a freshman. He made a freshman mistake at Utah. BYU is up 20 to nothing. I don't blame Zach for that. I, I blame BYU just injuries and lack of depth there. Uh, 2019 at Toledo. That's tough. I, on the INT, he breaks his thumb. At Hawaii, that third down completion, the throw is a little off. That cost BYU getting the first down in the game. So he's two and five one score games, eight and eight as a starter, six and five versus group of five or FCS. That's a tough stat. Two and three versus power fives. I'll take that. We've talked about it. It's just a 40% thing. So he can certainly be better. But those were his first two years. He got thrown in as a freshman because he was, a, he was better than Tanner Mangum at that point. I'm, I'm excited to see what he becomes. Am I jumping on the hype train? 
not yet because I want to see it happen. I want to see an eight plus win season where Zach is Zach, right? Where's the game where Zach is throwing for three fifty and four scores? You know what I mean? Like that's the guy I want to see. And it was I, the bowl game, <laughs> right? And that that was awesome. It was one game. It was Western Michigan. It was amazing. We need to see it in the first four against somebody in a game where it really matters. Now, I, I think he's going to be a good player. Um, I'm going to give him his upper classman years to develop it. I'm not ready to wear the conductor's hat just yet on the Zach Wilson hype train. I'm making it a thing. <laughs> there it is, faintly in the faintly. background. Yeah. <laughs> but I will happily be a passenger on the train right now. My stance hasn't changed since we last discussed this. He's going to have a full, healthy offseason, knock on wood. It might be a longer offseason than we want it to be. No shoulder strength or arm strength issues at this point. No accelerated timetable to try and get him healthy, which created, in my opinion, some erratic and inconsistent decision-making. But no injuries now. No broken thumb and a full offseason, healthy, training with John Beck. And Tom House, a guy who works with elite-level NFL quarterbacks on the regular. So I'm in. I'm a passenger on the train. I think Zach Wilson is going to make the jump as an upperclassman this season. The work ethic, the attention to detail. He's a great football mind. He's a football junkie. As long as he can maintain the health, I think great things are ahead for BYU and Zach Wilson. And so I'm excited to see what the offense can yeah, do. Yeah, and it's easy for us to sit here and go, yes, we're on it, and we want him to be. But da, 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 da. Zach, Zach's got to be Zach. And we saw, when did we see him be the most Zach ever? To me, it wasn't Western Michigan, because that competition was whatever. It was USC last year. Absolutely. Where his stats are good. They're not great, but he got the win. And he, he still wasn't even healthy. He led BYU in a meaningful moment in a meaningful game. That's the guy that he can be. We need to see more USC Zach than we see Toledo Zach. And I think we will. And I'm, I'm excited to watch that. Zach is the first to admit that he feels like BYU Will and can compete with Power 5 teams, but it's all about taking care of business against the group of five teams. Yeah, and, it, it, like, record as a starter. I'm not going to – if we're going to fully credit him for wins, then we have to fully credit him for losses. So how about we just partially credit him for wins? Does that make sense? Sure. He's 6-5 and five against G5 or, or FCS. That's not good. It's gotta, that's got to be, like, 9-2, and two, right? And then Power 5 is 2-3. and three. Like, that's just what it is. I'm not going to complain about being sub-500 there. Okay, topic two. As mentioned, in The Athletic, Eamon Brennan says BYU has a chance in hoops to become a mid-major power. What would that look like? BYU basketball as a mid-major power. They were there in the Mountain West Conference. BYU had attained that level. Mm -hmm. Uh, So qualifying for the NCAA tournament on the regular, uh, let's say three out of every four seasons, seven out of ten. The fact is that they need to be – a majority of the time qualifying for the NCAA tournament. I like how you said qualify. Like this year, BYU qualified, but they didn't actually make it because they didn't have a bracket. <laughs> like that counts, right? Take we, it for what you will. We feel like BYU was obviously going to be a six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. BYU needs to finish top two in the West Coast Conference most seasons, which I think would relate to f- going to the NCAA tournament most seasons. Displace St. Mary's as that regular team to finish second place. Win a conference title of some sort. It's too much to ask BYU to be the top dog in a conference that is dominated by a de facto Power 5 juggernaut that just so happens to play in a mid-major conference. Gonzaga is Kansas or Duke or whatever other powerhouse college basketball team you want to think of playing in the West Coast Conference. So if BYU can finish second consistently, go to the NCAA tournament a majority of the time, then they would be a mid-major powerhouse, just like they were in the Mountain West Conference. But the thing is, BYU isn't playing against Gonzaga in the Mountain West Conference. It's just a different, it's apples and oranges there. But those are the parameters. Get to the big dance the majority of the time, be the second-place team on a regular basis, display St. Mary's there, and at some point, Jerem, whether it be in Vegas or whether it be a regular season sharing of the title, win a conference Sharing championship. Stinks. Hey, whatever. I'll take it. I would take it. Yeah. BYU and Gonzaga both finished 15 and 3 in the West Coast Conference and tie for first. Great. Gonzaga's not losing three times. <laughs> uh, he, here's how I define it. Oh, wait. Can you be a mid major power if you don't win your league? Yeah. Let's talk about it. Who would you consider mid major powers in the game? 
So what? Wichita State, besides Gonzaga, Wichita State and Creighton and Xavier and Cincinnati-ish sometimes. Do you know whether they won their league? Dayton? It do- Dayton, yes. Thank you. They're emerging. It doesn't matter if you win your league. It doesn't matter. It matters about winning in the NCAA tournament. Winning. Wichita State was known for, oh, that's a team that could upset you in the NCAA tournament. And now they're not the upset you team. They're the favorite, right? They're a top five seed a lot. Uh, Creighton, same situation. Dayton was going to be a one seed, at two seed at worst in yeah. the tournament this last BYU year. BYU right? had the nation's attention as a team that was going to win in the NCAA tournament right. had it happened. So powerhouse implies that there's some consistency. There's years into that, right? So to me, it's not even just qualifying for the tournament. you got to win. you got to make a Sweet 16 run every couple of years. you got to dip your toe into the Elite Eight and maybe even a Final Four. Like, the what what... VCU is in a mid-major power, but they made a Final Four, right? Loyola Chicago. I would even take that over being a powerhouse. Just that one special season matters more over time than just being good. Like, being great one time is better than being good seven times uh, in, in the history books. You could make an argument, no, I'd rather be consistently good. That's what BYU basketball was um, under Dave Rose for, what, eight of the first nine years? was a tourney team one time they went to the Sweet 16, but they had the National Player of the Year and a guy with a unique name and everyone knew. A mid-major power to me is, yes, BYU getting into the tourney and going to the Sweet 16 once. And, 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 and that might have happened this year. And you know what's funny? You can turn everything around so fast. We've had this conversation before. Let's have it again. Oh, it takes time to build a program. Does it? If Last you have the year, right athletes and the right guy leading them. It's the right coach. It's the right coach. Because a year ago, BYU didn't make the NIT, and Dave Rose retires, and we're down in the dumps. And here we are asking the question whether BYU could become a mid-major powerhouse. It's been one year! It can happen so stinking fast if you have the right guy, and he establishes the right culture and gets the right people. I want what Hoops is doing to happen in football. I think BYU has the right things in place for the most part. That could happen. And then, bang, one season happens and we go, oh, independence is, is uh, sustainable and beat Utah and 10 wins. Like, it can happen so fast. Get the right people doing the right things. <laughs> it can happen so fast. Old man withers. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's old. It's, uh, it's the Cougar Quorum. You got invited to talk to this group of uh, fellas. Great gentlemen. At Sizzler. Great gentlemen. They call themselves the Cougar Quorum. At the Chicken Court on Blue. And they're there they're, they're going, oh, <laughs> San Diego, Utah. Yeah. Hey, the mid-major Steak power. And salad special. BYU at one point, Jerem, was 4-3 and three over a three-year span in the NCAA tournament under Dave Rose between 2010 and 2012. They were the mid-major power, but they were winning. They were a mid-major power, they, not the. Sorry. They were yeah. winning. Gonzaga's been tournament. that thing for 21 years. They won four games, though, and that added to it, right? That, that, that yeah, like it. winning yeah. a game. Yes. You have to make a sweet 16 run. Getting a, did. Yeah, getting a run and getting a win in the NCAA tournament. Like a lot of half, roughly half the teams do that every year. It's time for BYU football to become an independence powerhouse. Oh, okay. Led by Chip. Zach Wilson. What are your expectations for Zach Wilson in 2020? That is our question of the day. Let's go to Voice of the Nation. This is the Voice of the Nation on BYU Sports Nation. At Tanner underscore Jimmer 8 on Twitter. Tanner underscore Jimmer. Nice. I have high expectations this year, said every BYU fan. (laughs) He continues. The fact the second and third string quarterback have the potential to snag the starting position from Zach is going to make him more competitive and push him closer to his potential. Isn't that interesting? Jaron Hall and Baylor Romney are good, man. Baylor Romney beat a top 15 team. He's the first quarterback to do that since what? Taysom Hill? Right? That is Is that? that, Oh, no, sorry. Tanner Mangum against Wisconsin. Oh, that's right. Tanner Mangum beat sixth ranked Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah. So... It's crazy. And then Jaron Hall. Like, will we ever see Jaron Hall at, at what, see what he can do? I, I don't know. Because you have three good quarterbacks, which is a wonderful issue. Hashtag BYUSN Twitter, Facebook, and or Instagram. Coming up, the best to wear at the prime number of 17. 
Plus, the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. What is a fair expectation for Zach Wilson and why he thinks college football will happen in 100 days? This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. On the latest voiceover with Greg and Chap, the guys chat with Charles Davis of CBS Sports and NFL Network about his new game day assignment, how the league's handling COVID-19, and his impressions of BYU football. Watch it on the BYU TV Sports YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook account. We are live in Studio B. This is your day-to-day BYU Sports play-by-play. I'm Spencer Linton, teamed up with Jerem Jordan. It is my great pleasure to welcome in Greg Rebell, the voice of the Cougars on the Deseret First Credit Union hotline via Zoom now to discuss... Maybe a little bit of that uh, voiceover with Greg and Shep and specifically his optimism for a potential college football season based on what Joel Klatt of Fox Sports said. Greg, are you feeling optimistic like Joel Klatt that college football is going to happen in 2020? Yeah, I think we're going to play uh, one way or the other. Uh, it's going to happen. I, I And who knows? Are there fans in the stands? Is it limited? Is it... I. Would you be okay if it's some truncated version or do you just want it in any form or are you willing to wait to push it later or even the spring if we had to? Yeah, I'd rather not push it and wait. And, and I realize that it wouldn't be ideal uh, to have, you know, collegiate sports being played in venues with a percentage uh, of available seats uh, allocated for, for, for spectators. That wouldn't be great, but not much about 2020 is, is going to be ideal, right? And, and so um, if we get to that point and, and, and there's a great number of fans in the stands, that would be wonderful. But I think uh, just to have the sport back in whatever way with, with somebody in attendance, uh, you know, sports was not designed to be an antiseptic experience. Um, it wasn't designed to be uh, a made-for-TV competition with no rooting interest in the venue. That's just not what it's ever been about. And, and so to do it that way, again, is not the best-case scenario. It's, 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 it's maybe the best thing we can do for the time being, but it's not what anybody really wants. And the closer we can get to the real thing, the better. And the real question is, uh, you know, what timetable allows us to do that? Yeah, we obviously don't know how many people will be watching BYU football or any college football team, for that matter, in person. But we did talk with Dennis Pitta recently about uh, Zach Wilson and working with John Beck. And obviously, John Beck feels very good about Zach Wilson and what he is doing uh, as he progresses a quarterback at BYU. What do you expect of Zach Wilson, uh, regardless of how many fans he's playing in front of, when he starts his junior season? Well, I, I expect a guy that, that would look like we thought he would look, uh, like if healthy. I mean, and, and really last year we didn't really see, um, you know, that guy. Uh, it, was a, it was a race and a rush to get him just ready for the season. And he didn't have the prep that any quarterback would want to get ready. And, and just getting him physically to a point to throw was the objective. And as we found out after the season – uh, even up to the first week of the season, coaches had questions whether he'd be ready to go in that season opener. And and I don't think you, you could say he looked, you know, full go or 100%. He might even say the same thing. And then once he had the second injury, well, then, you know, all, all bets were off. So um, while it wasn't entirely a lost season, it wasn't Zach Wilson, um, you know, at his true capacity or true potential in 2019. So just just a healthy Zach Wilson should make a ton of difference. But beyond that, I expect a robust competition uh, to make sure that Zach is pushed by, by good talent, not just guys to say they're in the mix, but guys that can play because we've already seen them play. And that's what's interesting. I don't know that there's been a situation like this in BYU history where you go, does BYU have three capable guys on the roster of starting? Like Baylor Romney beats a top 15 team, right, in the rain. It was crazy. And Jaron Hall's athleticism was on display in a couple of starts, I guess one and a half games there. So for Zach Wilson, I I, I was thinking this, Greg, when we look at all the the really good BYU to great BYU quarterbacks, they had their upperclassmen years to really prove themselves. We have yet to see that with Zach Wilson up to this point. And we've also yet to see uh, the kind of continuity that makes a great quarterback. Uh, You know, since the years of, of John Beck and Max Hall, It's been a rotating cast of characters essentially every season. You know, Taysom Hill had that one year, the one year where he had a a complete year. 
But for the most part, uh, quarterback position has been snake bit for, you know, for, for, the, for the better part of a decade we're talking about right now. And, and again, though, those Beck and, and Hall years where you knew who your guy was going to be every game, barring injury, which actually didn't ever happen. John Beck missed one game due to a sprained ankle, and that's it over what six or seven seasons of play. And, and since then, it just hasn't been the case. And, and so, um, you know, the rhythm of preparing upperclassmen to have their years to shine and the continuity that comes with health have just not been there for BYU in a long time. Let's talk about the offensive line and those guys protecting Zach Wilson because both James Empey and Brady Christensen are receiving some nice uh, off-season or corona off-season uh, honors from Pro Football Focus. What do you expect of the offensive line? Are you buying the hype that these guys are going to go next level and that just maybe in a year or two we could have multiple offensive linemen drafted into the NFL? Yeah, I just broke it down on Twitter, guys. It's been 15 years since a BYU offensive lineman was drafted, as you guys know. And, and that capped a period where, you know, there were always linemen going, you know, for, for, you know, for about 20 years preceding 2005. It was rare that you'd go a couple seasons without a, without a BYU offensive lineman being drafted. Now you go 15 years without a single lineman getting picked by the NFL. Um, you know, clearly there's a core. You know, it, it's, it's the engine room uh, of any team. And, and it's, it's, it's interesting to consider that, um, you know, since Bronco Mendenhall came on board as head coach from that time until now, as, as good as some offenses have been for BYU, no NFL draftees in that bunch over a period of 15 years. It's quite remarkable considering BYU's tradition up to that time. So, yeah, now's the time, right? Let's get back into that game. And, um, and, and, and the belief is, you know, our belief is by watching them play and, and seeing those who grade these things with some level of proficiency – that BYU has talent that you could presume could be developed into, you know, NFL draftable talent. And, and wouldn't that be great? Because, again, it is, it is what makes the offense go, and it's been a long time for BYU to have that kind of success up front. Eamon Brennan of The Athletic uh, uh, Shifting Gears talked about BYU basketball in a mailbag saying they could become a mid-major powerhouse. So we, we talked in the earlier segment about – what that could look like, what that means. So do you feel like, and it's only been one year, but do you feel like BYU is trending towards that, that distinction of being a, a mid-major powerhouse? Well, just the fact that Mark Pope and BYU are in the conversation with so many high-profile transfers right now who are keeping BYU in their mix is an indicator of just how wide you know, BYU's talent net may be cast these days, and, and, and that's a positive. Well, let, let's not overlook the fact that, you know, for – you know, in, in the Dave Rose era, you know, BYU was, you know, it, producing. I mean, producing 20, 25 wins a year, getting into the NCAA tournament more often than not, many, many years in a row getting in. So they weren't that far away, and BYU is still not far away from, from being considered, you know, that, that, that kind of college basketball, you know, just below the Blue Bloods, right, in terms of names you recognize. Um, we all know that BYU's never been to a Final Four, but they do have the most tournament appearances without getting to the final four. They're, they're in the mix and have been for a long, long time. Um, you know, putting yourself in, in, in Gonzaga territory would, I think, be, um, you know, putting yourself in true powerhouse uh, territory. And, and, and Gonzaga is the team that is seemingly these days a, a, a perennial number one pick at some point in the season. Well, BYU's not there. Um, and, and that's maybe the bar, Gonzaga being the bar. But BYU's not, you know, that terribly far away from being just, you know, on, on that level you talk about after the P5s, who are the big names in college basketball? And you find all those Big East teams and teams like Gonzaga. And BYU, again, does get mentioned a lot. And I think what Mark Pope is doing right now is just upping BYU's profile because of all, you know, the transfers who are considering BYU right now. Greg Revelle, the voice of the Cougars, with us on BYU Sports Nation. Where has Mark Pope made the biggest difference? Maybe it is in the transfer portal, but where do you think he has made the biggest difference in impacting this BYU program? Well, I think you can see from his days at UVU through to BYU, his style of play was identifying um, you know, the ways to be the most efficient offense possible. And a lot of that dealt with three-point shooting. And BYU's jump from around 250th in the country to first in the, in the country uh, showed where Mark Pope thought BYU could develop and develop quickly, um, you know, with, with the most efficiency. And bringing, you know, players like Jake Toulson in was a big part of it, but it was also stylistic. And, and, and there have been others observing the game who've broken down, you know, just how Mark Pope runs and calls an offense. 
and it's it's free flowing, but it's regimented. And and there's that belief that that when BYU needs a play, needs a bucket, there's enough to go. That there's a lot to go to uh, to to make good things happen. And so I you know I I don't think that that BYU fans should worry about this being a a one hit wonder flash in the pan season where this this group of special seniors um, you know made something happen that, that that can't be replicated. I think it can be replicated and differently because BYU's roster in a 2020-21 is going to look a lot different. It's going to be a lot taller. It's going to have a lot more versatility, uh, particularly on the backcourt with the height BYU has. And so I'm just fascinated and intrigued to see what year two of Mark Pope's offense is going to look like. They're not going to abandon the three-point shot by any stretch, but they may not be number one in the, in the, in the country again and yet still be a very, very good and very efficient offense. Mark Pope's UVU numbers through his BYU season – just showed an uptick year by year by year in offensive efficiency and in three-point proficiency, um, you know, not coincidentally. Maybe it's just and once. That's the three-point play that BYU gets. It's just the bigs laying it in and getting fouled and making a free throw. Let's finish with this, Greg. Uh, yesterday was the 25th anniversary of the passing of Kresmir Chosich. Now, he had a, uh, you know, a three-year career at BYU. He was here four years. Freshman couldn't play, but... His influence on the game is unbelievable. We're going to talk about it later in the show a little bit more, too. But what are your recollections of uh, kind of Kresmer Chosich, what you've heard, what you've read, and the impact he had on BYU and the game of basketball? Well, everything you hear is that, um, you know, b- before, you know, the wave of internationals had come to the game, um, you know, he was, you know, the forerunner, one of the true front runners in that respect. And credit to BYU for being forward thinking that way. And that, uh, you know, while he wasn't, you know, Pete Maravich, he had, you know, he had the pistol peep flair. Uh, and, and for a guy of his size, how unique and remarkable it was for those who watched him to say if he could do things that, that nobody that size, you know, should normally be allowed to do. And, you know, you think about players like Kressmere and others of his ilk. And, and if, if, if his game had existed in a social media age, you know, just what kind of a phenom he might, you know, he might have been. And again, the numbers he put up, he did so without that one extra year of eligibility. So that's also something to consider just what he might have done uh, at, at BYU had he had played, you know, another season longer. Um, but uh, it, it's nice to hear those who did get to see him play uh, to truly bring home exactly how just different and, and one of a kind his game was, uh, you know, for BYU basketball at that time. It would have been fun to see him uh, play in person. Of course, never happened. Um, but we know enough to know how special – uh, he truly was. And guys, if I could just leave you with one thing today. I have done a lot of driving uh, in this state over 30 plus years and um, uh, did, did some out of state driving this past holiday weekend. And if, you know, if, you ever want, if you want an indication of just how much things are hoping or trying to get back to normal, you had to just be on the roads this past weekend. Uh, it was as crowded an I-15 as, as I've seen in my days here in this state. Uh, there are a lot of folks wanting to get back to life uh, as close to normal as possible. And there will be rules and restrictions kind of guiding us there. Um, but truly, the hunger is there. And we're making the right steps and making the right paces. And, and think about it, guys. You know, we're still three months away from, from needing to play college football or getting close to that point. And, and three months is a long time. Think about three months ago. That was February 26th. <laughs> and BYU just beaten Gonzaga getting ready to go to Pepperdine, there was nary a thought to any of what has transpired. And think of what has transpired in in three months. A lot can happen in three months. And we've still got three months to go. Hopefully, a lot of great things will happen, just as a lot of tough things happened in this past three months. A lot can happen, and hopefully it paces the right way to let us get back to what we all you know, hope um, is our life in the fall and, and winter. I never thought I'd want to see Mario Kart on I-15 around Lehigh again. But here we are, Greg. Here we are. <laughs> it, was, it, it was a wild and busy weekend. A lot of folks out there. And again, hopefully it's, it's just a sign of, uh, of where we'll, we'll, we'll end up. Greg, well said. And uh, we're in it together. We hope on. Always nice to talk with you. Thanks so much. Great to be with you guys. Thanks. The voice of the Cougars, Greg Rebell on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, you know why we show how. Coming up, why Kresmir Chosich is the most influential Cougar basketball player ever. Plus, our best to wear it athlete featured today has Jen Rockwood feeling really good. This is BYU Sports Nation. Welcome back 
to BYU Sports Nation, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Alongside Jerem Jordan, I'm Spencer Linton. Let's keep it rolling and whip it. It's time for the Cougar Whip Around. Football. James Empey is the highest rated center in the pro football focus best pass blocking offensive line returning in 2020. Got an 86.5. That was the high on any test I took at BYU as well. ESPN has Empey as the 10th best returning O-lineman overall. 86.5 would have uh, on the curve been an A-, minus, right? Yeah, it depends on the class. Fox Sports College football analyst Joel Klatt believes the 2020 college football season is, quote, 100% happening. Klatt added in a recent tweet his belief that fans will be in the stands to some capacity at most locations and that the season will likely start on time. Please, I hope he's right. Urban Meyer, a man who won multiple national titles, said in response to Klatt's thoughts, I've talked to enough people, they're adamant this will happen, and what that's going to look like will be determined. But they'll be playing, there'll be football this fall. And that's my question is, someone tell me how it's going to happen. Like, if someone gets a positive test, is everyone out for two weeks? That's what the current workflow is. So I want to hear how it's going to be different. Basketball. The Athletics said on uh, BYU Hoop Trajectory, that is a program like Gonzaga. This is Eamon Brennan. In a mid-major conference that isn't all that much of a mid-major in any structural sense. And no, there's no real reason BYU couldn't become a powerhouse. It's starting to feel like it's on its way already. Tennis. Sean Hill of BYU Men's Tennis named the ITA Mountain Region Senior Player of the Year. Hill represented as the singles champion of the ITA National Fall Championships and was named to the West Coast Conference all preseason team for a second straight season, posting an 18-5 singles record and a 12-6 doubles record last season. So, Sean, one of the best to wear a BYU men's tennis jersey, and that takes us to our best to wear it feature on today's show. Who was the best athlete to wear each number at BYU? We're counting up to the number 99, and today we hit number 17. Alicia Kramer Rose, she was the most decorated BYU athlete ever to come to BYU. That's still the case because at age 16, she played with the USA women's team and was uh, in the same conversation with Mia Hamm, right? Eventually quits, doesn't want to play on Sunday, uh, chooses that path, comes to BYU. She's the National High School Player of the Year in 99. She, as a senior, leads BYU with a really talented team to the Elite Eight and 03. And at that point in the program's history, it was just the ninth season, by the way. That was the peak. That's one of three Elite Eights in program history. 2012, and then this last season, uh, four-time All-American, two-time finalist for the Herman Trophy. That's the Heisman Trophy, if you will. Um, Just 2001 Mountain West Conference Player of the Year. 47 assists, most all-time BYU history. She is one of the greats in BYU women's soccer history. 11 caps, speaking of international play for Team USA, and she could have had many, many more if she wanted. Yeah but opted for something else. She's the Eli Herring of soccer, if you will, chose uh, Sabbath day observance over continuing to play. Didn't want that lifestyle, wanted to be a mom, wanted to have a big family. And what's interesting is if you talk to Alicia, she is still around. She's been on the coaching staff for a long time. Yes. Yeah. So if you talk to her, she's so soft-spoken and so kind, like one of the most genuine, kind-hearted people I've ever met. I want more ferociousness in Alicia. But then on the field, <laughs> she was. She was ferocious on the field. And so it's, it's interesting. She's the, she's the, she, uh, TJ Haas was the Alicia Kramer Rose later. A little bit, yeah. That Just sense? really nice, kind of yeah. laid back. TJ's soft super spoken. chill. And, and the then court. when you get on the court, it's like, unleash the beast. <laughs> it's something different. So, yeah, that's a fair comparison. But I love Alicia. I love her soccer knowledge. Um, and there's a reason that, you know, BYU women's soccer players – not only look up to her, but want to be like her, not just on the field, right. but as a person. And she's this tall redhead in the midfield, just this unique look, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, coming up, you wish Mark Pope knocked on your door and delivered a gift like he did to one BYU coach. Yes, I really do wish that. And Kreshamir Chosich, what does he meant to the program for BYU, not to mention our top five final games of BYU athletes? This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. This Friday, we celebrate the year that was in Cougar Sports with the Y Awards, a unique look and take on this. Typically happens earlier, obviously, a pandemic has changed us, but the Y Awards coming 
to BYU Sports Nation this Friday at noon Eastern time on BYU TV and BYU Ready. Get your bow tie ready, Jerem. It's ready. We, we've got the tuxes. Let's go, baby. The great Kresimir Chosich passed away 25 years ago yesterday on May 25th of 1995. Honestly, we need a few shows uh, or a few weeks worth of shows to adequately define the legacy of the former BYU basketball and international hoops star. Just how vital is Kresimir Chosich's legacy to BYU hoops? Our stat of the day will shed some light on that. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. Chris Chosich is the only BYU basketball player in the Basketball Hall of Fame. And he never played in the NBA. Let, let's talk about Fresh uh, for a moment. We talked about him a couple weeks ago in the Best to Wear It uh, for number 11. Um, it was He was inducted in John Wooden's class, by the way. How about that? So uh, Chris Chosich comes to BYU from Yugoslavia. That becomes Croatia later, where he lives, in Zadar, right? Um, and I tweeted out yesterday, great stuff from Dick Harmon of uh, the Deseret News recently on, on Crash. And then there was a documentary made uh, that you should watch online as well. So at BYU, he was good, but he was way better after. So let's talk about this. Because I think Chris Mucosic is the most influential BYU basketball player ever. I think Danny Ainge is probably the best player ever. When you look at influence, though, straight influence, Crash. Because what he did in the game in Europe uh, and off the court, frankly, has been amazing. So let's talk about it. At BYU... Couldn't play as a freshman. That was a rule, and it was a dumb rule, but they changed it. That's by weird. The, by the end uh, of, of his tenure here. 17th in scoring with no freshman season. If he had had a freshman season, he'd be top 10. Ooh. Still, uh, second in rebounds all time per game and fifth in scoring. He's one of the great – he's in the top three. He's with Ainge and Jimmer. Without with, a freshman season. Without a freshman season. Granted, maybe those numbers go down a little bit if he's still warming up. Uh, Yoli Childs passed Chris Mirchosic this last year in double-doubles, 48. It took 40 years almost for that record to go down from Chris Mirchosic. He was awesome. So he, he's drafted twice after his junior year to the Blazers and senior year to the Lakers. He chooses not to play. Ah, oh, it would have been fun to watch Chosic on the, on the uh, Lakers uh, seven years later with Magic Johnson, by the way. Can you imagine? Oh, he would have been on those teams. So he goes to Europe, and he had played already in the, uh, you know, the Olympics and got a silver, but he ends up getting another silver and even a gold medal in the Olympics, beating U- the USSR, beating the United States. World championships, two golds, two silvers, Woo! five-time Euro champ, eight-time national champ, meaning he won his domestic league. He was so influential that uh, Arvidas Sabonis uh, talked about him in this way. So this is from... Uh, a member of the International Olympic Committee back in the day. I can't pronounce the name. Antun uh, Vodolak. The best confirmation of logically choosing Chosich is the answer Sabonis, Arvidas Sabonis, Demontis Sabonis' dad, gave to the question on who his idol was. Modesty has never been a distinction of Arvidas Sabonis, but he did, however, say that he would like to achieve what Creso Chosich had, the best that had ever walked the basketball courts in Europe. Wow. Billy Packer said that Chris Mirchosich was the first great international player. He was the fourth All-American ever from outside the States. But he, was, he, he went home and had this amazing influence. He got baptized here. He ends up helping with the translation of the scriptures into Croatian. He's the deputy ambassador for Croatia to the U.S., lives in D.C., and just had this amazing influence. He is the most influential player in BYU basketball history. And we are in our 30s. I do not want people to forget about this guy. So that's why we're talking about him, because yesterday was the 25th anniversary of his death. He was so good, notable, influential, creative. He was a point center, 6'11 with a handle. You see the passes. Like, this guy was an all-timer, man, and he's in the Basketball Hall of Fame. He was taken from us way too soon. Yes. Died of cancer in 1995, but we're talking about a world political figure, not just a great basketball player, but I mean, his basketball career opened up some doors for him. But he wanted to make a bigger difference than just being an international superstar. So great respect for him. And it's fun to talk with people that got to watch him play on the regular. And I've had a number of conversations that were just like, and adding in is uh, K- Kathy Warner having from Twitter saying, loved, loved, loved watching Kresimir Chosich play. If you have never watched him, it is a must find the highlights. And we just showed you some I, of them. I'm going to look in the archives, see if we don't have a whole game. We can't, bust out here let me put this into perspective for the young bucks everybody loves luka Doncic, right oh luka Doncic. crush was that guy of his time in that area of and the at world 611 by the at way. 611 dirk Nowitzki. 
Kreshemir Chosic was that guy. Tony Kukoc was the number one player in Europe in 1992, right? Kukoc and Drazen Petrovic and those guys played with Chosic when he was older. And they all that? looked up to him. He was the GOAT in that area. Okay, He, he was Meaning the Europe. GOAT. There was great ball still being had, right? And we're seeing that more often now. Oh, man, opted to play and make an impact in his own war-torn home country. And just an incredible ambassador. Him. So, yes, if you're, if you're young and you've never heard of him, know who this guy is. Crash, know who this man. Guy is. He, yeah. He's the man that built the Marriott Center. Essentially. Essentially. How about that? Coming up, it's a summer pool trick shot season. And the top five final games by BYU athletes. This is BYU Sports Nation. This segment of BYU Sports Nation, presented by Delta Airlines. Keep climbing. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation, the show available anytime on demand via the BYU TV and BYU radio apps. And if you want the podcast, just Google BYU Sports Nation podcast and subscribe, rate, and review. Time for Top 5 Tuesday, presented by Delta Airlines. Keep climbing. And the finale of ESPN's The Last Dance not surprisingly, showed Michael Jordan hitting the shot to beat the Utah Jazz in Game 6 of the NBA Finals in 1998 to win his sixth and final championship. They had like 78 angles of that shot. This timeless moment got us thinking about some of the iconic last games for BYU athletes. And that is the premise of today's Top 5 Tuesday. Top 5 last games. Number 5, Carlos Moreno, 2004, BYU Men's Volleyball. They win the national championship. Moreno was the conference and national player of the year. He's the Final Four MVP as well. He's the setter. He was so good. BYU was down 10-6 in the 5th. Ends up winning dramatically 19-17 over Long Beach State in Honolulu for BYU's third national championship in 2004 in 6 seasons. To 1993, following a 6-6 six and six campaign that season, then John Walsh enters 94 with something to prove. Well, he proved it. 300-plus yards in nine games, 400-plus in one game, his last game. Facing Oklahoma in the Copper Bowl, Walsh delivering 31-45, of 45, 454 yards, four touchdowns, was named MVP of the Bowl. Might not be considered one of the all-time BYU quarterbacks, but that last game is an all-timer for sure. Unfortunately, he tried to go pro after this. Yeah, I broke my collarbone playing two-hand touch that day, by the way. Number three in 2019, Ed Eyestone became the first cross-country coach to win a national championship as a coach and player. So we throw <laughs> back to 85. Look at that mustache. He won the 10K or yeah, run at the NCAA championship in his last race, completing a triple crown, by the way. He had won the 5K, and he had won in cross-country in the fall. The triple crown. 84-85 national championships in abundance at Brigham. Ed. Number two. During his career at Brigham Young University, one Jim McMahon broke 75 NCAA records, clearly producing magic in basically every single game. His last career game at BYU... 27-43, 342 yards, three touchdowns, ho-hum to beat 20th-ranked Washington State in the Holiday Bowl. McMahon won the Davey O'Brien and the Sammy Ball Awards, finished third in the Heisman voting, a consensus All-American. Tom Homo had a pick six in that yes, game. Yes, he did. And the best last game at BYU ever, Steve Young, 1983. Beats Missouri dramatically. He throws... Rushes and catches a touchdown in the game. The walk-off moment <laughs> is incredible. It's right? so good, right? And the celebration was it was something. It was something. <laughs> 314 passing yards and a touchdown. Uh, you know, receiving, rushing as well, three total. Uh, Runner-up in the Heisman, Davey O'Brien Award winner. Best last game ever. That's Top 5 Tuesday. Now our question of the day. What are your expectations for another BYU quarterback? Zach Wilson in 2020, our elite voice of the day, presented by Sundance Match Resort. Charlie Alger on Facebook says, I expect his decision-making ability to be exponentially better with regards to getting rid of the ball instead of trying to force the ball down the field to make a play. Okay. Today's Rise and Shoutouts. Uh, mine goes to Mark Pope, who delivered a framed photo of BYU beating Gonzaga to Diljit Taylor. Speaking of uh, cross-country and track, uh, just knocked on her door and uh, delivering a photo. So, uh, I don't know if you can tweet it, Mark, if you want a picture and get it. or How does that way <laughs> DoorDash with picks? I want one of those. My rise and shout-out goes to BYU wide receiver Dax Milne. 
and his friend's pool trick shot. I mean, th- th- we've come to this point, right? Uh, social distancing, you, might, you yeah. do crazy things. I want to hang out here, wherever this is, by the way. Uh, off the head, flip it, going down the water slide, and then dunk. Yeah. It's impressive. Love it. Our thanks to today's guest, Greg Rebel. Sorry to Dustin Pitta. We ran out of time. Conversation continues 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Use the hashtag viewer. We did have a few seconds for him today, right? We did? Dust for Dustin. Oh, for uh, sound on tape? Maybe play the sound bite back. For Jerem Jordan, I'm Spencer Linton. Shout out to Dan Plater. We'll see you from BYU Sports Nation tomorrow. Go Cougs.